His publications, maybe some of you know his famous book, Basic Concepts of Intercultural Communication. One of his um, most important contributions to intercultural communication is his developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, which he will probably touch this uh, morning. He has been doing a lot of research on practical implications of intercultural communication, including leadership and intercultural competence. So we are very happy to have you here. Thank you for coming. And please, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. As I was so kindly introduced uh, with this eclectic background, of course, uh, one conclusion you could draw is that it's a dilettante, um, which uh, occasionally I'm accused of being. Uh, I prefer to frame it as a, a, a kind of hybrid professional identity. And uh, I, I'll try to bring that to bear on the topic here today, which is um, uh, looking at this issue uh, almost from a philosophy of science perspective. I mean, we, in cross-cultural psychology, there's a lot of attention to pretty precise empirical levels of analysis which is good and necessary, but sometimes occludes the assumptive base of that research. And of course, all research, like all perception, occurs in an assumptive context, a context in which we make certain epistemological assumptions about the nature of reality. So what I'd like to do is to return to that level, uh, but in a way that I hope um, applies to current uh, events, the current situation in which we find ourselves. Uh, although I do come from intercultural communication, which is a bit different than cross-cultural psychology, again, in its assumptive base. Nevertheless, I think that the two of our areas share uh, a topic of interest, which is intercultural, cross-cultural relations, and we share a concern for how that, how our findings apply to civil society in general. To put it bluntly, does it help us survive? Does it help us adapt? Does it provide us with some kind of map or narrative for the future? I believe it does, and I believe the time right now is particularly uh, crucial for us uh, who have slightly different approaches this, to this topic to come together, to be working together in a way that makes our voice stronger and more coherent. So that's uh, what I'd like to be uh, talking about today. And let me begin, uh, I'm afraid, uh, rather depressingly, but uh, nevertheless, with excerpts from William Yeats' poem, The Second Coming. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. And what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. So Yeats, uh, as you know, was, uh, was writing at the end of World War I and moving as, as the clouds were beginning to uh, form uh, for World War II. This, uh, of course, is a topic close to the hearts and minds of people here in Poland as for people in Europe in general. I'm living, by the way, about half time in Europe now, and so I, I'm feeling the European uh, uh, perspective on World War II, which is really rather different than that of world of, of the United States, uh, where I where I and my original home is. Um, now, of course, here people have experienced that, and if not personally, then their parents or their grandparents. Whereas uh, in the United States, it's more of an abstract uh, concept. Nevertheless, we find ourselves slouching, in one way or another, towards an uncertain future, uh, perhaps one uh, that's very fearsome. People in the U.S. are calling this uh, post-truth, 
post-truth. And uh, let, me, uh, let me put this into the context as uh, predicted of this developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. Uh, the model, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is based on uh, perceptual experience. So it's not a cognitive model. It's not even really a behavioral or uh, affective uh, model. It's a model of experience. It's a model based on the developmentalists, you know, Piaget, uh, Vygotsky, and others, uh, who suppose that our experience in the world is a function of our perceptual organization, our schema, the constructs that we bring to bear. George Kelly in the area of psychology would be notable in this regard. So this, this model is based on that idea. It moves from the idea that we experience, when we experience our own culture as central to reality, that is, that our culture is the truth, it's the way things are, it's reality, uh, that that is the definition of ethnocentrism, and that the alternative to that is the idea that our culture is one way of organizing reality. It is one window into experience. It is one organization of experience. That's ethno-relativism. And of course, these are, can be and are more complex concepts, but that's the, the basic uh, dichotomy. The movement then, which I portray in a linear way, although one can see, and I'll give some examples of where I think there's a movement, a nonlinear movement uh, around in this, but just as a, as a schematic, I present this uh, in a linear fashion. Denial, moving from denial, which is the failure to uh, uh, to perceive, which means the failure to discriminate in the sense of generating perceptual boundaries, that kind of discrimination. The failure to discriminate one cultural group from another. And this is based, of, of course, on a constructivist assumption, and that is that culture has no inherent existence. Culture is an observational category. So culture is something that we, as observers, bring to the kaleidoscope to more or less, quote, Benjamin Lee Wharf, the, the, the kaleidoscopic flux of human uh, behavior, we bring to that this observational structure of culture. And we say, oh, look at this culture, look at this culture, look at this subculture, look at this ethnic group. The, but these are constructions. These are ob constructions for the purpose of observation. Doesn't make them less useful. Doesn't make, and, and in fact, I believe that they're inevitable. But this particular construction is not. Nevertheless, when we construct the world around the idea of culture, the failure to perceive that culture we call, I call in this model anyway, denial. Denial meaning the inability to experience that. So if we fail to make the distinction of culture, we fail to experience culture. Alternatively, if you do make the distinction, you do experience it. It's a little bit like becoming a wine connoisseur. Yeah. If you distinguish between red and white wine, you experience the difference. If you don't, <laughs> it's just alcohol. Yeah. And as you know, people can move quite a ways along that continuum of, uh, of, 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 uh, of wine connoisseurness uh, uh, to the point of being able to distinguish the 1997 vintage from the North Harvest. Yeah. All right. So then the movement out of denial is into defense, and defense is recognizing differences, but thereby being threatened by them. And here, uh, we're of course, um, I'm drawing on cross-cultural research, largely the Alport uh, work and the, and the uh, Pettigrew and others that have uh, worked well with that, uh, that show that contact with cultural differences, at least under the circumstances of, uh, of unequal status, generate uh, a defense reaction. They, they, they generate a, an us and them polarized response. The resolution of that polarized response is into minimization. And minimization is to recognize our common humanity. And mostly people get the Nobel Prize for moving from defense to minimization. They say, we, we, we used to think it, they were them, but now we realize it's all us. Yeah. Nobody, for some reason, gets the Nobel Prize for saying, but we really are different. We're different, but we are equally complex. So the movement, the, this jump into what I would call ethno-relative consciousness, is the jump into recognizing that, yeah, we all share common humanity. We all have two arms, two legs, eat, sleep, procreate, and die. But on this, at the same time, we are organize our, organizing our experience in reality in dramatically and profoundly different ways. And it is the recognition of that that allows us to live viably 
with one another in the diverse societies that we're creating right now. It's not minimization. It's not saying we're all human. We have plenty of research now to show that minimization as a strategy is neither stable nor particularly effective in guiding people's ability to live in multicultural societies. Whereas acceptance apparently is a more stable and more useful condition in that regard. What, what acceptance does is to allow us to generate adaptation. Adaptation is the ability to intentionally shift our behavior, to increase our repertoire, to be able to organize the world in, alternatively, in alternative ways. Um, empathy would be a form of adaptation in this regard. And finally, to be able to incorporate that into our identity, into who it is that we think we are. This is the, these are the kind of people we are. We're people who do that. And in this sense, I'm using I, <clears throat> integration in sort of a personal way, much as John Barry might be using it uh, in a social way. You know, and many of the people who are integrated would consider themselves to be bicultural, or at least bicontextual <laughs> in some way. They may not define it in the same cultural terms that we use, but they'll certainly see themselves as people who are able to shift context easily. There was a, just as an aside, uh, an interesting study done at Harvard, uh, the, uh, Harvard University, the Harvard Leadership Initiative, in which 1,300 uh, innovative business leaders from the last century in this uh, were studied for their common characteristics. And as usual, uh, no personality characteristics were found uh, in common. There, there apparently is not a leader personality, uh, but that's not news to any of us here, I'm sure. What they did find, um, which I thought was interesting, was what they called a, a kind of contextual intelligence. And they used the term contextual intelligence. What they meant by that is that people appeared to be good at being aware of the context that they were in. In cultural terms, I guess we'd call that cultural self-awareness. And they were good at shifting out of that. They were good at recognizing other contexts and being able to see the value or derive value in some way from an alternative context. In intercultural terms, they were good intercultural communicators. I, th I thought it was interesting you know, th that, th that this idea, although it was not related to culture at all, it was related to context, nevertheless followed the same principle that many of us, I think, have discovered in our work, which is something about this combination of acuity, of self-awareness, and agility in the ability to shift context is central to people's competence in this area. Now, I'd like to suggest, uh, based on this model, that we're facing something like a perfect storm. If you remember that uh, movie and the, the, the metaphor is used, to, you know, when there are a, a, coal, a, a coalescing of forces that generate a particularly powerful condition. And I'd like to suggest that the powerful condition that we are um, finding right now is, first of all, the increase in movement, refugee, migration, uh, uh, environmental uh, refugees, people who are fleeing uh, the results of climate change, as well as uh, uh, civil unrest. And in all of these cases, it is generating greater contact. And again, following up on Professor Smith's comments from this morning and the well-known work in cross-cultural contact, we know what happens when there's greater contact without intervention, particularly when the circumstances are ones that almost guarantee cross-status contact, you know, meaning refugee and, and, and immigrant movement. So that generates uh, in itself the condition of the fear of others. The other part that's happening that's part of this perfect storm is the failure of minimization, the failure of tolerance, basically, the failure of the idea that somehow if we just recognize that we're all human, everything will be fine. And this, as I said earlier, is an unstable condition. And it appears to be unstable because it doesn't take much for a demagogue to come along and say, you thought you were the same, but look what they did to your ancestors. And we've seen it in the former Yugoslavia. We've seen it in Rwanda. We saw it. We've seen it early in our, earlier in our past. And we may be seeing it again. So this is adding to the idea and then now there's a third piece to this, which is, I think, a little less obvious than these other two. And that is, 
relativity has been co-opted. Relativity, this idea that you have your perspective and I have my perspective and we need to be respectful of one another has been co-opted by people who are saying literally, my perspective is I'm a racist. You, you should respect that. <laughs> Try to argue against that. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're thrown off into, you know, dealing with Bertrand Russell levels of abstraction or something in trying to, you know, in, or quoting some other uh, philosopher of ordinary language to try to say, well, no, 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 those statements are at two different levels of analysis. Yeah, well, in fact, the idea that we must be respectful of other opinions no matter what has come back to bite us. We are, we've shot ourselves in the foot uh, and, or the other metaphors that could be used for how it is that we now, now is the time for us to rethink at least the simplistic notion that we have been sometimes bringing to relativism, which is you have your opinion, I have mine, we should respect that and move on. So this is the perfect storm. Uh, there is another piece to this which I would like to explore now, and that is that these, um, that these positions are related to underlying epistemologies, to underlying uh, paradigms, if you will, of the way we're organizing um, our assumptions about reality. On the, the, the ethnocentrism side, uh, these are largely related to universalism, uh, what, which I'll call a Newtonian paradigm, the idea that we are uh, living in, a, in a, a, a real world that if anybody looks in the right direction, they'll see the same world that we see. And that uh, this stands in some contrast to relativism, which is, no, no, we, we, we are experiencing that world differently because we have different perspectives in the world. And finally, uh, what I'd like to suggest, suggest as a position of constructivism, which is, yes, we are living in different worlds, but we are also responsible for the construction of those worlds. Beginning with the notion of Newtonian paradigm, which, um, and here I'm making the case uh, sort of from Thomas Kuhn's uh, discussion of uh, paradigm in science, uh, the, his famous uh, structure of scientific revolution. I'm, I'm making the case that those paradigms transfer typically in a 25 to 50 year lag into social science. So initially the paradigm is defined in physical science, largely in physics, theoretical physics, and then once established there, social scientists, who after all want to be scientists, notice that the paradigm changed in physical science and that slowly begins to affect the way that the social scientists conduct their research and inquiry. So the Newtonian paradigm, uh, uh, transferring in as absolutism, universalism, or positivism, thanks to um, Comte and uh, the father of sociology, uh, is based on this epistemological assumption that reality is the way it is. If you look in the same direction, you're going to see the same thing. That the observer is a kind of an objective observer, almost an omniscient observer. And I, I'm gonna mention observer all the way through because the, it's the act of observation or the assumption about the act of observation that changes as you move from paradigm to paradigm. So in this assumption here, the, the observer is capable of making an objective observation, almost, if you will, a godlike uh, observation, although Newton was careful not to put it in those terms when he argued for this position to the Catholic Church. <clears throat> The, an interesting thing for us, I think, in the work that we do is to look at the general implication of this paradigm for how we deal with alterity, with otherness, you know, with, uh, in this case, looking at civilization or groupings of civilization. And my observation here is that from a Newtonian perspective, the, the really only coherent view is that is that differences in the way people are represent variations in some way that are either better or worse on a single universal reality. And this generates what I think we recognize as the well-known hierarchy of civilizations. Popular pretty much at the turn of last century, uh, but still you might uh, say uh, alive in some quarters. 
On the top of the pyramid are the civilized people. They're the people who define the pyramid, of course, for the most part. You know. and they're the people who say, we, we have the best variation on civilization. Below them are the barbarians, people who could be saved. We, if, we call in, if we colonize them or if we convert them, the Americans call it nation building. If we could go, you know, kind of help build their nation, the, these developing, developing towards what? Well, developing towards being more civilized. You know? So if we could help these developing people, then they, they would be civilized and we could more or less share civilization. And at the bottom, unfortunately, are the savages who are the people who are really not quite as human as the rest of us and it's okay to exploit them. I'd like to say that that idea is completely dead, but you know it isn't. It's just who we define as savages has changed a little bit. But indentured labor, sex slavery, is every bit as based on that assumption as African slavery was in the, in the colonies. So here are some of the ideas that go along with this, not all of the ideas, and some of them I suspect are arguable. I, I put a question mark just uh, in honor of the context uh, on the last one there. But, uh, but social Darwinism, clearly, although you, you understand Darwin never said anything about this, something like this, but, you know, I mean, Darwin talking about finches, you know, and how it is that if, they, if you have different sized nuts, you need to have different sized beaks to break the nuts. But, but the social Darwinists have come into that, that idea, but again, sort of co-opting the, uh, the notion of science, have come into this idea and said, oh, what this means, that fitness means superiority. Well, in fact, that really wasn't Darwin, what Darwin was saying. Darwin was saying fitness means the ability to co-ontologically survive in an environment. But you know, never mind that. If you, if you come back to this notion of social Darwinism, the people at the top are the people who deserve to be at the top. Teleological modernity means that we are moving in some direction. So modernity means that we are uh, moving along a path towards betterness and betterness, and that the teleological is the end state, whatever that end state is. And people, uh, of course, who are the civilized people are the ones who are defining the teleological goal. Um, of modernity. We hear the term neoliberalism, particularly associated with Ayn Rand and um, objectivism and some other uh, terms like this, which I suspect, in fact, are a re um, uh, elicitation of this hierarchy of civilization. So if, if some of the rhetoric that you're hearing lately sounds reminiscent of this, I think it's because it is. I, I think neoliberals are, in fact, attempting to resurrect this and saying rich people deserve to be rich and poor people deserve to be poor, which is essentially an application of the hierarchy of civilization. Then the question really for us, which I, I'm not going to do anything other than raise here, is does positivist research, in the sense that we are making the assumption that there is an actual reality out there which we can approximate better and better with our, with our data, does that contribute to the maintenance of this paradigm. And if so, is that what we want to be doing? And if it's not what we want to be doing, if we don't want to subtly be supporting this hierarchy of civilizations, is there some way that we could continue doing that research, but by calling attention to the way that we're using it, avoid the implicit support for this kind of, a, of an organization of reality? So I'm, I'm going to leave you with that question and move on to some, uh, some other issues here. Let me mention uh, in passing that, um, of course, the Newtonian paradigm comes out of the particular Western, to use uh, the term again from Professor Smith, uh, the Western notion of, uh, of enlightenment uh, and the resurrection of, of Greek thinking and so forth. Um, that uh, this is not the only approach to science, the alter, I call them alter enlightenment approaches, but um, you know, as, as most of you know, uh, the golden age of Islam from the 8th to the 13th centuries, to the typical terms, uh, time frame that's given to that, uh, all science was located in the Islamic world. You know, it, it wasn't located in, in, in Europe, and Europe was a pre-enlightenment society. <laughs> or whatever that means. And uh, so, so I, we should acknowledge, and I'll only do this briefly, 
that, uh, that other approaches to science have occurred and continue to occur in, uh, in society. In, unless you define science narrowly as post in Western post-enlightenment society, other attempts to understand the world in systematic ways, taking science as something like that, exist in other paradigmatic contexts. In the case of alter enlightenment contexts, largely Islamic contexts, it is also possible to study natural phenomena, but we must, but from that point of view, we must never lose sight of the fact that those natural, natural phenomena are manifestations of God, and that the observer himself or herself, frequently himself in that case, is embedded in a relationship with God. That it's not possible for the observer to be objective in the sense that we sometimes use in Western culture in which the secular and the sacred have been bifurcated and we can talk about a, a, a secular observation of something in which we don't include uh, uh, being a, a relationship with God. But this would not be possible here. And by the way, it wasn't possible Coper it wasn't possible for Copernicus to make that argument. It wasn't in, in Western culture. It wasn't possible for Galileo to make that argument. Newton was the first person who managed to make that argument. My guess on how he did it in, in Western society, my, my guess about how he did it is that he told the Catholic Church, you know, it's true that God has made everything. But we should think not of God as the everyday director of the movie, but as the producer. You know, he's kind of back there, he supplied the money. You know, but he's not actually directing the movie. I mean, the movie, the script is already set, you know, so, so what we need to do is just to study that. You know, so. Sorry for the uh, mixed temporal metaphor there. All right, so in any case, the, the implication for alterity here is rather interesting, which is you are the chosen group. And if you look back at societies that uh, that derive from that time, many societies maintain this idea of being the chosen group, of being the group that's chosen by God. But that doesn't mean that you have to kill off the other groups because it may be that the other groups, you're able to interact with them in some way uh, that's useful. And so uh, trade, as many people point to, as the basis of interculturality in pre-Enlightenment times uh, may well have been based on this kind of an assumption here. Ethical implications of, universe, of universalism, I think, first of all, if knowledge is a universal reality, and if I know something that you don't, there's something wrong with you. Pretty simple. And I need to fix you. And the first thing that I do to fix you is educate you. But what I'm doing by educating you is I'm helping you to understand things the way I understand them. And then the next, the next thing, if, if, if I try to educate you and you resist that education, then I figure that there's, you're probably a little bit crazy, so I need to therapize you. And if I try to therapize you and, and you don't come around to seeing things the way I see, then it's not like I say, oh, maybe things are different or maybe you're having a different experience of reality. I then assume that you're crazy and I, uh, or, or that you are um, malevolent in some way and I'm then able to uh, lock you up. Again, I wish we were further away from these assumptions than apparently we are uh, reading current news. Civilized people have the truth by definition, and so it's okay to impose that. For those of us who said we shouldn't be nation building, we, speaking as an American, should not be engaged in nation building in the Middle East. For people who are coming from a universalist paradigm, that's really not a question because if you're sure that you have the truth, it's like being a missionary. I mean, the missionaries were, assumedly, for the most part, not uh, concerned with whether they should be doing what they were doing. They were concerned about how well they could do it because it was the truth. Universal religious principles and human rights as another set of universal principles apply to everyone whether they know it or not. So for those of us who live in Europe and who see universal human rights as a major aspect of the shared values of Europe, we should be thinking again, like the positivist researchers, how can we be committed to those values and not implicitly support a universalist paradigm that also supports the hierarchy of civilizations? 
As most of you know, the great, uh, the great movement against, against universalism, against absolutism, uh, was uh, first conducted uh, by Einstein. Uh, and I, what Einstein did was to say, you know, you really can't be an omniscient observer because here we are moving relative to the rest of the universe and our little part of the universe, and so we can only see the rest of the universe from our point of view. And so the idea of perspective in that sense entered into physics and out of physics entered into social science in the form of relativism. The assumption here is that there is an absolute reality but that it only can be perceived in a limited way. The observer is necessarily subjective, meaning the observer is restrained by his or her context. Consequently, civilization needs to be understood in context. You can't understand a civilization universally. You need to understand it as existing in its own context. And this was the Franz Boas, uh, Margaret Mead, uh, Ruth Benedict, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gregory Bateson, a uh, long line of anthropologists who are basically saying we need to understand things in their own terms. And this is, the, of course, the basis of all kinds of relativism and certainly underlies a good part of the work. I'd like to suggest that it underlies the assumptive part of the work that we do. It doesn't necessarily uh, underlie the research that we do to support those assumptions. Therefore, we are always in the position of some paradigmatic confusion, meaning that we're making relativist assumptions about the nature of reality, but we're using positivist methods to try to measure those assumptions. You, see, you, you hear what I'm saying about this? And this may impede both the quality of the research and the quality of the outcome or the assumption that we're making, the, the quality of the application that we can make of that. So the underlying ideas here, of course, familiar to us, I think, multiculturalism and diversity, adaptation adjustment uh, theories uh, fall into this category clearly, all kinds of postmodern critical theory. I mean, the deconstruction of anything pretty much follows these rules of uh, of, of uh, relativism. And the, the research that tends to go along with this is more critical qualitative research, which has got its own problems associated with it, but nevertheless represents a kind of a, a contrast to the uh, quantitative uh, positivist research that sometimes uh, is associated with uh, universalism. So when we look at the, at the implications of this, the phrase that is frequently used by intercultural trainers anyway, which is, it's not bad or good, it's just different, is a really pernicious thing. Because the further down the road we go of, it's not bad or good, it's just different, the, f the closer we get to the idea of, I'm a racist, it's not bad or good, it's just different. You're not a racist, I am. And further, I have, have, I have the power which is the, uh, the other assumption here, that since in extreme relativism, well, no, this is a different assumption, that in extreme relativism, every person exists in their own unique context, which is a kind of contextualism, which really means that in, an ex in its extreme form, relativism denies culture. You can't really talk about culture because culture denies the uniqueness of the individual. And so unless we introduce ideas like, you know, multi-level uh, identifications, we can't, maintain both of these ideas without, again, creating a kind of internal incoherence. People can't empathize with other people because you're locked into context. I'm a white male. I can't understand women. Well, that may be true, but, you know, but specifically, I, I, because I'm locked into the context of being a dominant culture male in my society, it precludes me from this point of view from empathizing or participating in the, in the experience of somebody who is not in that context. What that does then is to generate power as the only mechanism for interaction. If the only way I can understand you is to do something to you, and the only way, or the only way I can relate to you, never mind understand, the only way I can relate to you is to do something to you and vice versa, we end up in power relationships. And thus critical theory appropriately studies power relationships because by the definition of this paradigm, there is nothing else. Which in turn has in the social dimension created political correctness. 
And uh, as you know, in the United States anyway, political correctness is being uh, touted as one of the major factors in creating the Trump movement. Um, I, I can't say that that generalizes outside of the United States, but in the US, I think it's wor worthy of, of, of looking at this. Uh, here are the assumptions. Each, each one of these represents that, that since each culture operates in its own context, if you take something out of that culture, it's cultural appropriation. Like if you name a, a, a team, a sports team, by the name of a Native American group, like the, the Indians or the Cherokees or something, that's cultural appropriation. Even though the Cherokees might in fact not be objecting to that. There was a, there was a, a, a woman that I know in Berkeley uh, who was severely reprimanded uh, on Halloween for wearing uh, a, a costume that was related to the national dress of another group, saying, well, you're denigrating the other group. See, this comes from this kind of thinking here. Um, the dominant group, uh, then once you assume that people are locked into their groups, then you've got a dominant group that is dominant by virtue of using their position to define the rules of the game. Then you have non-dominant groups, and the non-dominant groups need to be protected from the dominant groups, and that generates the PC police who are by and large gener uh, watching politically correct language and looking for implicit bias. I'm not saying these are bad things, but I am saying that these things are part of a relativist paradigm which currently is being extended and exaggerated to the point that it probably is detrimental to the work that we're doing. Not that we shouldn't be doing this, but we ought to be thinking about how we're doing this in a way that may not be supporting the negative aspects of the paradigm, which is it's not bad or good, it's just different. Here's another uh, rendition of this. Facts moving from the, from the universalist uh, idea, facts move from being objective to being selected according to your perspective. A dispute is about the actual truth of a matter as opposed to the dispute is a clash of narratives. We hear that a lot. Argument, you, you're looking for the most objective evidence as opposed to it is appropriate to manipulate the facts to support your narrative. See, so from, an, from the, the extension of the relativist paradigm is into the appropriateness of the manipulation of facts because it's all about narrative. It's not about the facts, it's about narrative. And news, therefore, doesn't need, shouldn't be objective. First of all, it can't be, but secondly, it shouldn't be objective. News should be uh, the, 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 the manipulation of facts. And then you can claim that it's either real news or fake news. The caption, you may not be able to see it here, is uh, the, the commentator is saying, that was Brad with the Democratic weather, now here's Tammy with the Republican weather. <laughs> Just an extension of that. Well, moving, uh, moving towards the conclusion to this idea uh, is the notion of ethicality. And, and here I'd like to um, so talk about William Perry and, and the work that Lee Kneffelkamp, uh, recently of Columbia Teachers College, has done in, uh, in, in uh, modernizing his work. The quote there, the search for truth obscures what ought to be the foundation of ethical choice and understanding and request for the views you disagree with accompanied by, here's the important part, conscious commitment to the choice you make in the face of viable alternatives. So the idea of ethicality here is not that there is some absolute set of right and wrong rules that we should be following or that anything goes, but that it's a function of our understanding things that we disagree with and then making a commitment, that is exercising some responsibility. The scheme uh, in uh, Perry's terms is like this. We're seeking truth either through dualism of uh, seeking truth from an authority or by f when we fail to find that truth or when the authorities disagree with one another as they frequently do in uh, educational institutions for instance that that then throws us into a, a state of multiplicity which is uh, they sometimes describe it as whatever it's the whatever position you know you, you hear you hear young people saying that sometimes now whatever you know you say well what about this what about that whatever you know. What that is representing is, well, people disagree, and we can't know what the truth is. Therefore, whatever. Or the other, a slightly more dangerous aspect to this multiplicity is that there is a truth, but it's being intentionally hidden from you. And there, it's a conspiracy. 
to hide the truth from you, and therefore, for the, the real news is the news that exposes that real truth that has been hidden from you. So what they suggest is that the movement out of, that, uh, out of, out of these positions uh, is into taking perspective, creating meaning. I work with students a lot on this, and, and the question that I say to them is, is, is think of something, something or somebody that you really disagree with, and then tell me what's good about that. Now, you can mentally try it right now. You know, think of the thing that you hate the most, but that you know that some other people do or believe that it's, you know, and then think, well, what's good about that? Not, not in, a, in a negative way, not in a, they think that's good, but they're stupid. But in a, if I, how would I feel if I thought that was a good thing? And you have to be a little careful in how you do this because it can take you down some rather dark roads um, of imagining some unpleasant things that you would prefer not to realize that you are able to imagine the goodness of that unpleasant thing. But what these people are saying is, unless we can do that, Unless we can think about, you know, as, as one student asked me, what's good about Saddam Hussein? You know, this was back in the invasion of Iraq days. I'd say, well, you know, somebody thinks he's good. He thinks he's good. You know, tell me. <coughs> she wasn't able to. And, and you know, she, her question was, am I being ethnocentric in supporting that invasion? And my answer to, in, in the end was, yes, you are being ethnocentric. But you could have been ethno-relative had you been able to imagine his alternative, his, his goodness. What's good about that? and then said, but I'm committed to the world being a different kind of place. So the movement out of this is into what they call um, commitment within relativism, which is being able to make considered choices uh, within, uh, after, after having considered viable alternatives. I mentioned Lee Knefelkamp because uh, for some of you who know about ethical development models like Kohlberg, they sometimes are criticized by women uh, for being uh, overly rational, rationalistic. Uh, therefore more male biased. Uh, and she, who's, if for those of you who know her, uh, a well-known feminist, uh, is suggesting that this idea of commitment is not a gender biased idea. That, uh, that the, the research she has anyway shows that men and women equally uh, are able to be committed or not to uh, positions, viable positions. So when we put this in paradigmatic terms, we can see that these underlying ideas of truth-seeking are largely universalistic, that when we start shifting our point of view to looking at the alternatives, they become relativistic. And, and here's the key, I think, to be able to make a commitment, we must become constructivists. And, and I don't mean in, in an ideological sense, I mean we must have command of what we would call a constructivist paradigm, because it's the responsibility of constructing reality that lies at the, at the root of this. So uh, th this paradigm, this last paradigm, as most of you know, is related to the quantum movement, which has been since the beginning of the last century a kind of competing movement in uh, physics along with relativism. So Einsteinian relativism and quantum mechanics were occurring more or less at the same time that as uh, emphasis has moved from the macro uh, uh, level uh, in which black holes and the operation of gravity and space and time uh, made uh, Einstein's work the focus and is moving increasingly at, to the nano level of quantum uh, computing and other uh, subatomic uh, levels, we're seeing a shift in physics from an emphasis on relativism to more of an emphasis on quantum mechanics. And we are beginning to see that reflected in social science. The movement, uh, the, the underlying assumption here is that the observer is no longer objective. The observer is not simply limited by perspective. The observer is engaged in a co-construction of the event. That's the, the term co-ontogenic or co yeah, co-ontology, it comes from co-ontology, but it's co-ontogenic, means that there is a, a, a mutual causality going on between the act of observation and the way that things are being observed. And I mentioned in pass and passing, but I'm not gonna explain it, the wave and particle nature of light it has to do with how you observe it. Okay. 
So culture then, from this perspective of looking at alterity, is both the collective process of constructing reality and its product. Uh, I've written a blog that got a, a, a ton of hits uh, called Why We Shouldn't Be Talking About Culture As If It Were an Iceberg. So this is against the iceberg metaphor of culture. You know, there's 10% above the surface, 90% below the surface. And you know, I was chiding the intercultural trainers. I was saying, you know, you're, 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 you're supporting a, a, you know, a universalist paradigm here while you're trying to teach people how to be more constructivist. You know, you're using this kind of uh, absolute, you know, culture as something floating around in the water paradigm to, to talk about it. So uh, they challenged me to come up with an alternative and the best I can do so far is the idea of looking at culture or any construction of context as a kind of river that begins by flowing rather freely over the surface and then through a process, again, that I won't describe here, but I refer you to Umberto Matoyana and his work on the Tree of Knowledge and uh, with uh, Francesco Varela. Uh, and other work is a beautiful constructivist, uh, Chilean constructivist uh, biologist, uh, but he writes for social science. Uh, but through that process um, of then of, of forming the banks of the river, even steep banks, even creating canyons, which appear to be constraining the river and, and, and obscure the fact that the river created those boundaries that it was the movement of that water which generated the banks which now constrain the movement of that water. So it's that idea, that kind of co-creation idea which lies at the root of this paradigm. Things that go along with this are the perceptual development that I've been talking about, social construction, cybernetic self-organization, which is the term used by Matoyana and the other, von Furster and uh, uh, and some other of uh, Václavik, Paul Václavik, uh, who has written a beautiful book on this called Radical Constructivism uh, that refer to cybernetic self-organization. Uh, In terms of research, certainly the work I've been hearing recently from the, the sophisticated people using this, that, that mixed method, particularly multi-level, and an increasing body of actual constructivist research is moving in the direction of being, of calling attention to the assumptions that we as researchers make as we organize our observations of whatever it is that we're researching. You know, and this is the idea, is what is it that we can do to bring our own assumptive base into greater clarity as researchers as we approach the research uh, process. So here's, the, here's kind of the last, uh, the last summary of, uh, of this idea of, uh, of, of ethicality in a, in a world of, of uh, uh, alternate facts. You notice I said worlds of alternative facts since each one of those sets of alternative facts generates a different world. Yeah. So here we have the dualism position. Everybody who looks correctly is going to see the same thing. The multiplicity position, which is everybody's got a bias. You've got your bias, I got my bias. Yeah but we see that that does not take us to a good place. Contextual relativism, which is the recognition that your experience is true and my experience is true. So we don't have to give up the, the, that essence of relativism, which is respect for other people's experience. Because your experience is true because you're organizing your experience around your perception of, of events. So I can't say it's not true. But what I can ask you is, where does that lead us? Where does it go? When we put that together with other people, what kind of narrative does that create? Who do we think we are? And where do we think we're going? And that's the question I think at the end, which is actual, crea actual reality, actual reality, which I, by, by, which I don't mean absolute reality. I mean the reality that we live collectively. Actual reality is created by our collective choices. Truth is being constructed. That doesn't make it less true. We're, we're constantly constructing boundaries and saying, cross that boundary and we'll kill you. Huh? There, 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 there's nothing more true than that. You know, you're dead at the, on the other side of that boundary. And yet, the conditions of that truth have clearly been constructed. So insofar as we're constructing those kinds of things, the quality of that truth, meaning the, the, where that truth is taking us, uh, becomes our responsibility. <laughs>